Thank you very much. So uh, what I really hope to uh, inspire here is uh, Team Germany and potentially a Team Austria to participate in the league. And I think that uh, Henrique should be the pilot, uh, one of the pilots for Team Germany. And so please encourage that. Uh, so yeah, so like he said, I'm a co-founder of an amazing company called Megabots. Uh, so the thing about robots is that robots have existed uh, throughout entertainment history. Uh, and there's a robot for every kind of person in the world. And so if you sort of look on this you know, uh, cartoon, you can maybe see some robots that you've uh, grown up with, that you grew up wanting to uh, create or getting inspired by. And when I tell people what I do, I literally say I'm living the dream. And the reason that I'm living the dream is because I get to cruise around Oakland, California, not in an autonomous Google car, which most people freak out about when they see on the road. Um, there's only one thing that's cooler than seeing a self-driving car on the road, and that's seeing a six-ton, four-and-a-half-meter, human-piloted robot mech uh, cruising down the streets of Oakland. So um, this is actually a full spread from Top Gear magazine, which we didn't even know that we were going to be in, uh, but we ended up being in Top Gear in the UK. Uh, so these are my two co-founders. This is uh, one of the robot geniuses, Matt. He's our electrical controls guy. This is Guy. Uh, he's our CEO, my co-founder, and lead mechanical engineer on the project. And um, I'm going to sort of tell you more about them a little bit later. Uh, a big part of what we're doing is we're actually turning engineers into superheroes, real world superheroes. And so my job by and large is to make them world you know, famous. And as we bring on more teams to make other engineers more famous as well uh, to inspire the next generation. So uh, maybe just sort of covering what this machine is. So the machine was, uh, this is called the Mark II robot. This was built in uh, 30 day, or, uh, 100 days with the help of 30 people. There was only two uh, engineers that worked on the project, which are Guy and Matt. Um, this machine has 13 degrees of freedom. It, uh, it's running a 2500 uh, hydraulic, uh, PSI hydraulic system. It's got a 24 horsepower uh, Honda generator engine in it. Uh, the only thing on this entire robot which was not uh, custom designed and, and put together are these treads, which came off of a 289C uh, skid steer, which is one of the largest skid steers ever made. And actually, uh, we got this, uh, these parts um, uh, out of basically a junkyard, and it had been through a fire. And so they threw it out, and when we, when we started up the robot for the first time, and it started moving, all of the sort of uh, burnt ash that had sort of frozen inside of the, of the treads kind of like unclogged itself, and there was black stuff everywhere, and so we think that that's kind of cool that we're bringing back to life. Uh, but everything else you see was uh, custom uh, designed. So uh, I just sort of want to uh, tell you a little about what we do and then tell the story about how we got here and hopefully uh, give you some inspiration. So we are literally bringing science fiction to real life. And like I said, with robots, uh, for the last 50 years, there has been a trope in science fiction. And that trope is, at some point, no matter what franchise, science fiction franchise it is, if that franchise is set into the near future or far future, at some point, a human will strap themselves into a giant robot and do something with it. Whether it's fight somebody, whether it's fight aliens, uh, Avatar, uh, Iron Man, uh, you can think of a whole list of others that are not included on, on this. Um, this literally is why our company exists and why we do what we do, is because we want to make science fiction real for the first time. And what's interesting is that we tell people that we are actually not a robotics company. We are actually a sports league and entertainment company that happens to make cutting edge robots to dominate our industry. And that's pretty sweet. Uh, we come out of a background in, with uh, uh, working with DARPA and Boston Dynamics, so military grade robots, advanced R&D with companies like Eaton doing uh, hydraulic robots and uh, hydraulic sort of construction equipment, uh, cutting edge uh, 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 hydraulics technologies. So, 
what's the difference in terms of how we guide our company? So, you know, when you look at DARPA or military, you know, grade robotics companies, these are some of the values, uh, you know, that engineers and that people who work at the company are expected to sort of adhere to. You know, you have things like, uh, what are the actual capabilities of the machine? Uh, function over form. And so, in the case of Boston Dynamics, you've probably seen some of these robots. They were meant to be a, a pack horse for the military to carry like 1,200 pounds of uh, military gear for soldiers. Uh, the other interesting thing is that with most of these, there's a single customer and consumer, and that's a military general, usually, or it's the CEO of Caterpillar. And uh, that's a big difference in terms of the way we think at Megabots. So the way we think is that, you know, instead of machine capabilities being the, the focus of how we design uh, the technology, we actually think about storytelling first. And so not what is the robot going to be doing, but what is the robot going to be portraying and how are people going to uh, become a, a, a impacted or affected emotionally by the machine. Uh, the machine robustness, and that basically is talking about, you know, performance ability. So the idea is that we're going to have, you know, uh, hopefully 24 of these machines on the road going to stadiums around the world, uh, similar to FIFA World Cup. And so how do we break these machines down with no tools? So that's a challenge that we set for ourselves. So can we pack a, you know, six-ton uh, machine into a shipping container without using any tools? Uh, that's something that we actually learned from uh, working with uh, a company in the United States called Feld. Um, and uh, so we went there, we got a, you know, a nice tour of the facility. They're the ones that do all of the monster truck rallies and they are the ones who own the circus. And it was a really eye-opening experience in terms of what we need in term, uh, for our company. Uh, at, at the circus, they back the train right into the shop. And so the maker space actually has a train that backs into it so that they can load things onto the train and send it out uh, to stadiums around the country. And uh, with monster trucks, for instance, monster trucks uh, and the staging around the circus, those things are put together with no tools on site, no instructions. And so that's something else that we learned that was important, is that when this machine shows up in a shipping container, uh, it's not going to be experienced people that are putting it together. It could very well be, you know, uh, a crew, you know, just random crew guys that would set up for a festival or a concert. Um, and so can we design a machine that has that type of, uh, you know, robustness and, and the teardown and setup capabilities? This is what we're doing to hype up the league. Uh, we are fighting against uh, the Kiratas robot uh, in, in Japan. And this is going to be happening, uh, you know, later this year, uh, I can say Q4 of this year. And uh, I'm sure that most people in this room will watch it and hopefully that you'll, you'll love it. Um, but really that fight is just hyping up what we're actually doing, which is building uh, an international sports league. And so where we're going is, you know, arenas full of, of these robots shooting giant paintballs at each other. Uh, doing melee combat with uh, uh, chainsaws and swords and hammers. Uh, and uh, we have a, a team that's interested in putting like a, a giant beaver tail with spikes on the robot. Um, who knows what the German robot's weapon would be, but it would probably be a hammer, I or that's a good idea. Um, and maybe some, put some lighter hose in or something on it, I don't know. But the idea is that each team, you know, is, they're showcasing their creati uh, creativity and sort of the, the storytelling of their, of their country and, you know, maybe their school or their team as part of the robot. So it's not only about the, the robot itself, but it's actually the creativity about how they express that robot's capabilities to the world on the world stage. So literally living the dream. We are a cross between a science fiction franchise, which I grew up loving science fiction, but we're also a sports league, so similar to Formula One, uh, UFC, and NASCAR. And these are not small businesses by any means. Uh, most of these numbers are actually already outdated. I mean, Star Wars was purchased by Disney for $4 billion, um, but they've probably already made that $4 billion back just on the first Star Wars movie. Uh, so much so that they're, you know, they just filmed uh, the, the, the next Star Wars 
they had some screenings. Disney didn't like how the, it was screening, so they said, okay, bring the entire crew back. We're going to reshoot the whole thing. Like, that's how much money they're making from Star Wars. Um, so that's our goal. And, you know, the roadmap that we see uh, that we're following is very much similar to Formula One. So Formula One, at the end of World War II, there was a bunch of uh, fighter pilots and there was a bunch of airplane engines sitting on the tarmac. And so, you know, folks got back from the war and they said, okay, what happens if we put uh, an airplane engine in a car and go real fast in it? <laughs> And that was Formula One. So there was a formula that kept changing, uh, and that was sort of the, the, the engineering standards that would go into the race cars. And so you can think of us as doing something very similar, except with robotics. Um, instead of putting these robotics into you know, uh, missile turrets and things like that, why not put them into uh, you know, giant combat robots for sport? <laughs> That's the way we think. And so, same, same idea. Uh, you have one car that turned into multiple cars and $16 billion in revenue. Um, and then you have Star Wars, which is the story side. And so Star Wars dropped with one movie in you know, the 70s. People didn't really understand what the, the story was about. They were promised a few other stories. They didn't really know what happened before that in the storyline. They didn't even know, like, what are all these crazy aliens? And it was kind of campy, kind of like a B-movie. And yet, Star Wars ended up being what I call a storytelling machine. And that's the beautiful thing about sports, and it's the beautiful thing that we're building, is a storytelling machine centered around uh, uh, technology, advanced technology, and the people that bring that technology to life. And so that is uh, what, we, what we're doing at Megabots. Um, in terms of our experience, um, this is actually the easy part for us, and that is building humanoid, the most advanced humanoid robots on the planet. Um, so the robot right here was, uh, this is called Petman. Um, so this is a robot that uh, Boston Dynamics created uh, that uh, eventually became uh, this robot, which is the Atlas robot, also a Boston Dynamics robot that was uh, run by IHMC. IHMC is our controls partner, so we have an exclusive partnership with them. So they provide all of our uh, walking and control algorithms. They've been doing walking robots for 15 years. They placed almost every single team in the DARPA Robotics Challenge, uh, and we've got them uh, signed up to help us with the control and balance. This is LS3. This is the, a pack mule robot, also produced by uh, Boston Dynamics. Um, so my co-founder, Guy, is actually, he was the lead systems uh, uh, integrator and the lead mechanical engineer on this project. So that's kind of his, uh, his, uh, his baby, as it were. And uh, this is a, a, a digital hydraulic pump um, that my other co-founder, Matt, was working on at uh, Eaton Corporation. And that's actually how uh, Matt and Guy met each other for the first time, is that uh, Boston Dynamics went to Eaton Corporation and looking for a new form of digital hydraulic pump. And even though they, didn't, they ended up not putting that pump in this robot, um, it did spark the, the, the very beginning of Megabots because Guy and Matt realized like, oh my gosh, you have the exact skill set that's opposite to mine. It, what happens if we combine our skills, the best of mech and the best of electric controls? Um, and so it sparked the idea. This uh, robot is Stompy. This lives in Boston. This is another project that our team worked on. Uh, this is a hexapod robot. It stands, when it stands up, it's 18 uh, feet across. I'm not sure what that is in meters, but it's huge. And the idea is, you know, it was built as like, kind of like a hot rod project in the garage uh, so that, um, you know, you can take your date on, on the beach or in, <laughs> into parades and freak people out. And, you know, it's kind of like this post-apocalyptic parade uh, float. So um, these are some of the things that we've worked on, and I've got a few videos. So this is uh, Big Dog, and if there's, uh, if there's sound that you could turn up, that would be useful as well. But um, this one might not have sound, because I know it's incredibly loud and annoying, which is the reason that Boston Dynamics actually failed in, in some way, because the military, after spending so much money 
uh, to develop these robots, they said, oh yeah, we forgot to say that we needed to be quiet. And they're like, <laughs> you know, like we just spent like millions and millions of dollars. Um, so, you know, this robot is the one that you've probably seen, you know, like on YouTube before. It, it's walking on ice, able to sort of, uh, you know, maintain its balance. This is a hydraulic uh, robot, and, uh, and it's definitely something that uh, our team worked on in the past. Let me see if I can change it with this. Uh, so this is the Petman robot, also a Boston Dynamics robot. This robot was developed in order to test out uh, chemical weapons suits to make sure that uh, you know, there was no holes in it. And so, for instance, like when Fukushima happened, you know, the way that they would normally test the suits that people would walk in with uh, was, you know, either with, uh, you know, animals or, you know, no, no way to test it really at all until, uh, until they sent someone in. What's interesting about this is, uh, is that actually Guy uh, became the model for this robot. And so they actually did a 3D scan of, of Guy, our CEO, walking. And then that's the same movements that they programmed into the robot, <laughs> which we think is pretty funny. Um, so yeah, that, that was a, a full humanoid. This is the LS3. This is what Big Dog became, so it's even bigger. Um, this robot is basically meant to be a pack horse. And you can sort of hear the motor a little bit in the background. Um, and this is, a, like I said, a reason why the uh, military ended up not using it. This project um, is what Guy, our you know, uh, CEO and lead mechanical engineer, was working on when he realized uh, the critical thing about hydraulics and scaling up hydraulic robots uh, arbitrarily, basically. So something that's really fascinating about robotics is that most roboticists and most robot companies are focused on electric robots. The problem with focusing on electric robots is that once you get anything over 1,000 pounds, you can't scale up anymore. And it's because of the actuation uh, that's actually lifting the force of the robot or the load that the robot's carrying. But with hydraulics, you can actually scale up arbitrarily. And so in some ways, uh, a way to look at it is uh, if you try to balance like a pencil or pen on your, on your hand, then it's kind of hard to balance. But if you have like a broomstick or something that's much longer, then you can easily balance it on your hand a lot easier, right? And that's a, a, a similar way to giant machines is that the bigger the robot gets, actually the easier it is to maintain its balance. Um, so that was another key lesson learned uh, from Boston Dynamics. Boston Dynamics. What they need up. is a transformer. So this is another project that our a team has experience working on. A typical marine operation goes from sea to land and back again, and that means a heavily armored, fully weaponized land vehicle that turns into a top-speed sea-going vessel without stopping. They call it the expeditionary fighting vehicle. Yeah, I like that guy at the end. <laughs> um, so this is another one. Um, this is pretty cool. This is so that you can uh, basically drive tanks off of ships, um, create a bridge. So this is a hydraulic robotic bridge, um, and it's able to sort of you know, move along with the waves, which is uh, one of the unique things about it. So it's uh, reacting in real time. and. Uh, yeah, and so needless to say, for most people in the world, building the robots is actually the hard part. And for us, it's actually what we're really good at. The hard part is building uh, a, a billion dollar sports league. So this is our partner, IHMC. This is the Atlas robot that was in the DARPA Robotics Challenge. Um, and again, this IHMC Robotics is our control and balancing partner. So what this robot is doing is basically looking in front of it and balancing and walking over the If any of you watch the Dark Robotics Challenge on YouTube or online, one of the funny things that you'll uh, remember is that these robots are really good at certain tasks. Um, you know, fairly complicated tasks, but then there's other tasks like opening a door handle where the robots just epically fail. 
And so this amazing machine is like, you know, autonomously walking over rough terrain and then it gets up to the doorknob and it turns the doorknob and then the whole robot just falls <laughs> over. And it's something that is really critical for why we have humans in the robot. And it's because there's certain tasks that robots are incredibly good at, but there's other tasks where humans are way better at it. Um, and so you can imagine where the technology that we're developing is eventually gonna end up. It's gonna end up in uh, construction vehicles. It's gonna end up in mining equipment. It's gonna end up in uh, you know, going to Mars with Elon Musk. Uh, mining asteroids, colonizing the moon, all of these types of, uh, of, of, of things. Uh, this is a, I like this one, this is a trash, really advanced trash. And this is something else that our hearts can work on. This is exactly the point. Much longer. That's mad. So super cheesy, cheesy uh, corporate video, but. Um, so one important thing to note about sort of who we are, where we come from, and hopefully to inspire everybody in this room is that we're not just, you know, coming from this background of sort of like military grade R&D, but we're also coming at it from this side of literally maker spaces, the maker movement, art, Burning Man, uh, all of these sort of things that you think of when you think of the Bay Area, uh, you know, Silicon Valley, all these crazy people out there. Um, and so these are some other random projects that our team has worked on. Um, Made in Space is pretty cool. Uh, they're, they put the first 3D printer into space. Um, and my friend Jason uh, started that company. Um, yeah, this is one of the world's largest Tesla coils, which, um, which is pretty sweet as well. We've yet to do a photo shoot with it, but um, those are some of the, uh, the other projects that we've worked on. So in terms of like, you know, how, how are we able to do this and fund advanced R&D through entertainment, and this is the, this is the way. So this is the, the business model behind what we're doing, and we'll give hopefully you all an insight into how you could generate a lot of money uh, by borrowing this type of business model. You know, um, it's a new way of thinking. It's actually, we believe, way more efficient as opposed to military contracts. So just like most sports, you know, we charge tickets. So we, we have ticket fees. Uh, we have TV broadcast fees and obviously sponsors on the robots. But then we also have the science fiction uh, entertainment side. So things like toys, games, uh, movie adaptations. Uh, and these are not, you know, small numbers. And so like I said, uh, when it comes to like some of the broadcasting rights uh, for, it, you know, similar sports, um, I can give you some numbers. So as an example, the Olympics, right, which is a little bit bigger than motorsports, but uh, the Olympics, NBC actually paid almost $8 billion for the television contract to the International Olympic Committee. Uh, NASCAR, which is you know, a huge motorsport in the United States, NBC paid them $4.4 billion for NBC to have the rights to show the sport on television. So you can imagine if there's 24 teams, if Team Germany is one of those teams, and we're able to generate the type of audience that we hope to generate, there's gonna be billions of dollars that are gonna be flowing to teams through the league, similar to Formula One. Uh, Formula One, over the last 15 years I mentioned, they've generated $16 billion in revenue. Um, and the beauty of that is that Formula One actually uh, generates about $700 million from hosting fees alone. And so, for instance, with Megabots, the first match between Team USA and Team Japan, uh, we got interest from countries around the world without, you know, calling them. Um, we got some really fascinating uh, interest from places in the Middle East, places in Asia. Um, and so you can imagine the same types of countries uh, that want to host Formula One events are already lining up to host uh, Megabots matches or battles. <laughs> Um, we even have a, uh, a firm in Maryland which is uh, already asking us what kind of battle arena, custom battle arena, like $300 million stadium custom built for this, do you guys want? And we're like, mm, well, we, it needs to have robotic bartenders, obviously. 
needs to have like everything robot, you know, and so that's kind of a cool thing that we're starting to spin up now is basically creating this per permanent uh, robot circus, essentially, for the modern age. Uh, what's also really important to note about Formula One is that in addition to the $16 billion that the league generated, um, 10 of the Formula One teams raise $750 million a year in sponsors. And the beauty of this is that if the robot league, if the Megabots league becomes really popular, then you'll have sponsors lining up likely in Germany or Austria to put their logo onto the robot, to sponsor the pilots and the team. When the team comes back, even if Team Germany doesn't win or Team Austria doesn't win, they're gonna be treated like national heroes, right? Similar to the Olympics. And so all of the kids, we're gonna look up to these folks. And this is the beauty of what we're doing, is that for the next generation, they're gonna think, wow, how do I learn how to make a robot? How do I learn how to become a, a robot? Well, to do that, you have to first get good at STEM. You have to get good at science, technology, engineering, and math. And so that's a big part of, of, what, we're, of what we're hoping to do. And then the other side of what we're doing is eSports. And so this is a little known fact, but the most watched sporting events the last uh, a few years have actually not been normal sports. They've been video games. And so people, in, especially in uh, places like South Korea, in South Korea, the, the uh, national sport is actually StarCraft. So if you go to South Korea, you will see StarCraft players, like literally video game players, are the equivalent of Olympic champions in South Korea. And it's starting to become more like that in the United States and around the world. Um, and so the beauty of what we're doing uh, is that we're able to sort of combine esports in a way that no one else has ever done before. It's a completely brand new form of entertainment that blurs the line between physical reality and video games and real life and fantasy, and nothing else has been able to do it. Yeah, esports market is expected to grow 43% uh, by uh, 2019. Uh, this is a, an example. Uh, so these are folks just, you know, playing video games on a stage and the packed stadium of people just watching them play video games on the stage. Uh, so I would like to sort of give you this vision of what, what it could become instead of that. There's something uh, that's uh, becoming really popular actually in the toys industry, which is called Toys to Life. And so you might have seen some of these. Disney has one. Nintendo has one. And there's, it's basically these little figurines that have like, I think, NFC chips in there. And you're playing the video game and maybe you get to a certain checkpoint, but in order to unlock the next level or to upgrade your character, you actually have to go to the toy store or online and purchase a toy and then tap the toy onto the video game console. And so imagine the possibilities of what this can become uh, with something like Megabots, right? So we've already done a 3D printed version of our upgraded robot. Uh, this is the robot that we're building next, the Mark III. Notice the flame throwing cigar in the teeth. <laughs> we'll get into that a little bit later. But um, so imagine if, if we have the, a video game and uh, instead of you know, putting traditional marketing money into it, what we're able to say is we're saying actually no, uh, buy the video game for 20 bucks on Steam. You build your mech in the video game. The, it's like a simulation of physical reality. And so the same types of challenges, engineering challenges that you would face in the real world are the same things that you would face in the video game. And then we have an eSports tournament. We sell tickets to the eSports tournament. We sell sponsorships to the eSports tournament. Uh, people come out, they play at the eSports tournament, except when it comes down to the final eight, Instead of those last eight people sitting on a stage playing video games, we say, okay, congratulations. We're now building your robot in the real world and your mech that you built originally in the game becomes an actual giant robot. You have to get your parents' signature to sign a waiver. <laughs> and, and the kids are gonna say, I told you, mom. <laughs> video games is a thing that I can do as a career. Um, and, and then we make, them, uh, make people celebrities uh, like that. They go on tour, 
their robot started in the video game, it comes into the real world, they go uh, uh, on tour and they actually become a real world uh, robot fighter in a, pil uh, a pilot, and, uh, and then a toy version of their robot gets created and then sold at Toys R Us or sold on Amazon. And you can even imagine that those NFC chips are in that toy robot. And so you can see the, the circle that we're able to create where you know, we go from the real world to the video game uh, to the toy and back again. And then you can do other interesting things uh, because these machines are walking supercomputers, right? Uh, so you can imagine the arena uh, combat is happening and the fans are, uh, are sitting in the stands with their mobile phones and they're on the Megabots app and they're supporting their favorite team. And the idea is that we have you know, elements of the arena which t you can hack into as a fan. And so there's participation during the live events. So it's not just esports in terms of kids or people sitting around watching other people play the game, but everybody, for the first time in history, is actually a part of the game. And it's a sport, but it's a giant video game, and it's fantasy, but it's real, and that's why I love my job. <laughs> because if it works, it's gonna be ridiculous. So um, again, you can sort of see how we go full circle um, you know, throughout that business model. So I want to now tell you the story of how did we get here and you know, how did this all happen? How do you actually build this robot? Um, and so here we go. So this is starting in February of 2015. The robot, of course, begins in design phase. And so a lot of Adderall, a lot of Red Bull, a lot of staring at computers uh, in, in AutoCAD, Autodesk software, um, designing the mech. And this happened over and over, staring into computers. <laughs> so a lot of people think, oh, you, you guys are building a robot. I want to see you building the robot. You know, 80 to 90% of that process happens in a computer in the design phase. Most people don't understand that. <laughs> you have to explain it. Uh, and then once you sort of have that scoped out, then it becomes a matter of actually making the things. So we subcontract out some of the parts, but then we also build some of the parts ourselves. Uh, so this is Matt, uh, you know, cutting some steel. Uh, this is me. We did a 3D printed version of the robot first, uh, a few different versions of the 3D printed robot to, as a test. Uh, so this is like a water jet thing cleaning off the 3D parts. Uh, this is actually on Pier 9. This makerspace is sponsored by Autodesk, which is one of our lead sponsors. Uh, without Autodesk, we literally wouldn't exist. The uh, CEO of Autodesk is this guy named Carl Bass. Um, who uh, Henrik mentioned that he knew as well. And uh, he just like this super cool dude who like immediately saw what we were doing and just started laughing. And he's like, you guys are crazy. Um, but you know, you should do this as, let's do this as a marketing thing and see if it works. And I'll tell you how, how well it worked a little bit later. Uh, but at the beginning, they gave us access to their makerspace, which was really awesome. So this is a, you know, a water jet machine. Um, so we're cutting out uh, a lot of the steel plates uh, water jet machines are crazy, you know, like if it cuts your hand, it's just water. It'll like slice off your hand like uh, Luke Skywalker, you know, in Star Wars style. Uh, very dangerous. Uh, this is one of the arm cannons as we were uh, starting to assemble it. Um, so uh, all of this is custom, you know, cut steel. Um, we ended up, you know, we welded at the edges. This, this turned into a Gatlin gun, so you can see uh, the Gatlin gun. Uh, which shoots uh, sort of six inch uh, or uh, four inch bore giant paintballs, which we also custom make. Um, and so uh, what's fascinating about this, uh, this cannon arm, this weapon system, is that we ended up crowdsourcing it. And so we said, whichever person around the world who can come up with a weapon system that will shoot giant paintballs, um, we will give you, you know, a little bit of cash but mainly, you'll just be epic and awesome because you're designed a cannon arm for the first real mech in the United States. Uh, so the winner was this guy, uh, Rob Masek, out of uh, New Hampshire, um, designed this, and we ended up using it and actually uh, put it together. And what's even cooler about that story is that, you know, Rob Masek was a name on a, on, on a contest, online contest, for a long time. 
we started call, you know, talking to him and sort of tweaking some of his ideas to get this Canon to eventually integrate into our systems. And fast forward a year later, he's now our uh, project manager in our company. So he actually moved from New Hampshire. Uh, and so the dream is also alive and well uh, with Rob. <laughs> Um, this is during the build mode, um, so just can't stress enough how, uh, how much energy and effort went into actually making this thing. We had a premiere date, which was Maker Fair in the United States, in the Bay Area. Um, you know, we had to hit that date, and so we were working 18 to 20 hour days um, as we were bringing this thing up. Um, you know, still doing design. Uh, you can sort of see some of the guts starting to come together here. So these are the actuators uh, in one of the arms. Uh, I got the lucky job of priming and painting the entire robot, which took a lot longer than I thought. Um, and so lots of time spent uh, bringing this thing up as an experiment for the first time, not knowing how it was gonna come together, not knowing if it was gonna work, what was gonna go wrong. This is uh, pretty hilarious. So the first time that we started up the engine, uh, you know, we didn't know what was going to happen. Like we have a lot of hydraulic hoses happening in the robot. You know, it's not a uh, un, it's not a not safe situation. It's very unsafe actually. Uh, and so we en we ended up tying a string to the uh, to the key in the engine <laughs> because we didn't want to like basically blow up in case something did go wrong. Uh, luckily, nothing went wrong. Uh, this is what we call the nest. So, of course, uh, so these are all hydraulic, you know, hoses, uh, you know, valve stacks. Um, uh, and, of course, we put this nest right below where the pilots sit. <laughs> so if there happened to be a hydraulic leak or a little pinprick in one of the hoses, piping hot oil would spew up into the pilot's legs and probably injure them for life, you know, so smart thinking. We're changing that design in the upgraded robot, but we learn by doing, right? <laughs> um, and then little small things, and when I say small things, like literally small things, and so we spec'd out everything. We're, you know, to the point where we're starting to put these valves on the robot, you know, a week away, two weeks away, um, and it turns out that these, you know, uh, the valves were one size wrong. And so it's like, oh crap, you know, like, okay, it took six weeks to arrive, so how are we gonna get this freaking part, this stupid, like literally like three, or I think it was actually four of these just little things, and without that, the whole system doesn't work. So I literally got the lucky job again of driving from San Francisco to Sacramento to Los Angeles, hunting down these four little valves, which eventually we found. And, and made work. This is another shot of them, uh, of the guys starting the engine uh, for the first time. Um, then we started, you know, putting the weapon systems uh, on board. This uh, cannon arm was actually one of the, the, the tougher pieces uh, because it uses like a, a vacuum seal inside to make it work. So as the, as the gun rotates, there's like this vacuum, this rubber vacuum uh, suction cup kind of a thing that, uh, uh, main, you know, creates the vacuum and then and then uh, retracts for the uh, during the revolution uh, of the gun. So uh, again, this is the uh, the pilot. Uh, this is the, what the driver sees in the back seat to drive the machine. Uh, this is literally the prototype. Obviously, the the version that we're building now is is a lot more sophisticated um, in every single way. But again, this is the minimum viable products of giant combat robots. So in total, we spent $175,000 to build this robot. Um, and obviously the gunner sits in the front. Um, so then we started putting, uh, we put the legs on. And you can sort of, and when we put the legs on, we were using a 10, ton, uh, 10 ton overhead crane. Uh, and when we put the legs on for the first time and, and it, people started you know, like, oh, okay, it's coming together, you know, and there was some excitement there. Um, and just, again, working like 18-hour days. Uh, finally got it all sort of put together, and then uh, Matt, again, electric controls guy, he's like, well, there's no software for this thing. <laughs> We're like, what have you been doing? He's like, I've been welding, man. Um, and so, you know, we had to, uh, he was working, again, like 20-hour days trying to get the software to work. 
Uh, the software finally worked. Uh, there was some tweaking to do because when you would move the joystick at first, it would go the opposite way. So we had to you know, do some jockeying with that. Um, uh, one of my jobs was to find and uh, test out uh, virtual reality cameras. And so we had a virtual VR camera on board uh, last year when we uh, first premiered it. Um, and then finally it started coming together, the paint job obviously. Uh, so something that's interesting, we painted it to look like a construction vehicle and to look like a, a really scrappy underdog robot. So we intentionally did not want it to look new and shiny. We wanted it to look kind of old and crappy. Um, and uh, we actually brought on uh, the concept designer of Finding Nemo because Pixar is right down the street from us. And uh, so this woman's like, yeah, I, I can do that. And so she actually helped with the, uh, with the design. So we finally got all this stuff together, literally hours in time when the truck arrived to take us to uh, Maker Fair. Um, so we drove the thing for the first time literally that day. Uh, this is the first time we'd ever driven it, hoping that it would work. It somehow worked. The truck got there, and then we look at the ramp on the truck, and we're like, oh, shit. <laughs> Who's driving? <laughs> uh, and so we, we, we ended up finally getting it on the, uh, on the truck and we, and we took it to Maker Faire, chained it down. And classical San Francisco Bay Area style, we hitched a ride on the truck with a Burning Man art car, which is a leather-headed horse with flame-throwing stripper poles driven by a guy named Chester. <laughs> and that is a true story. And... Um, yeah, <laughs> that's all I'll say about that. Interesting characters that work in our same space. Uh, so we finally, you know, we unloaded at, at Maker Faire, and then we're like, oh my gosh, now we have to actually have, have paintballs. And of course, we had not created any of the paintballs yet. So then we got to work uh, making these paintballs out of, uh, you know, some uh, basically like starch and stuff, food coloring, so that it's not actual paint in case it gets in your eye. It's not going to, you know, be really bad for you. Um, we got our art car from Pittsburgh. Uh, they actually towed this thing from Pittsburgh. This guy was so happy that his car was the first one to ever be destroyed by America's first mech. <laughs> and he, he loved the idea so much that he literally drove from Pittsburgh. He towed this from Pittsburgh to California just to write Pittsburgh on the car so that we would destroy it. And destroy it, we did. <laughs> Um, these, are, these are pretty cool. Uh, these are giant samurai banners that Autodesk created for us. Um, and you can see the Autodesk logos and stuff. Again, all of this is basically Autodesk gave us just enough money to make this thing happen and see how it worked. And then finally, after all of this work, uh, you know, we finally premiered the robot. Uh, this is a lot of the core team that, that helped uh, make it all happen. Uh, David, he's now our lead uh, uh, fabricator. Uh, Nat Hunter, he's a hydraulics expert. Um, so we, we shot some things, we destroyed the car. Uh, this is the, the sort of the epic shot from our premiere day that a fan took, actually, and this has not been photoshopped. People are like, oh, you put in the smoke, and we're like, nope, that's literally just the best photo we've ever seen. <laughs> and so this photo is like one of the top ones when you Google us, uh, and you can see Matt up there. Um, I ended up becoming the MC, so I was the guy like, you know, hyping up the crowd and trying to make sure that no one was killed um, with errant paintballs. Um, so you can see like uh, a little video clip of us uh, destroying uh, the car. It definitely packs a punch. It's 125 miles an hour. If one of the paintballs hit you, it, you would literally die. Um, so they are meant to create sort of damage and look really great on television. Um, and that's sort of the idea. So we had this great premiere uh, and then we took it on the road, right? And so we're like, great, we made this thing work. Now people are gonna give us money to start our sports league. <laughs> nope. <laughs> So literally we started saying, okay, well, you know, what about uh, conferences? Would conferences pay for us to come with the robot? And at first, a few did, and uh, actually this is a museum. Um, so the Computer History World Museum uh, was the first museum to ever house uh, uh, America's first mech. Um, we did some Australian TV shows. This guy's an Australian uh, TV host. Uh, one thing that was cool is that we ended up winning the uh, editor's choice at Maker Faire. We got this blue ribbon. We got a few news articles written about us. Um, and, we, and so then what we did is we went to L.A. And we said, surely somebody in Hollywood is going to give us millions of dollars to make this thing a reality now that we've proven that we can actually do this and build robots. 
So this is Matt uh, walking with our concept posters into the dungeons of Disney uh, Studios. Um, and you know, so we ended up doing all of these pitches, uh, lots of pitches, uh, lots of pitches. Uh, this is sort of sums up uh, what happened after about a month of, uh, of pitching in Hollywood. Uh, people trying to, to steal all of our IP. Uh, the way Hollywood works is not like Silicon Valley or uh, business investors. They say, oh yeah, you, we'll give you the money. Just sign this document <laughs> during the meeting. And we're like, no. And then we show it to our attorney and our attorney's like, obviously don't sign this. Um, so this is, uh, you might recognize uh, Godzilla in a certain movie studio's headquarters that might have made Godzilla and Pacific Rim and other things. Um, and it was actually this meeting um, that we took this photo on the way out because we were just like, these people are ridiculous. They're like, they're all chumps, you know? Um, so we took this photo and then we went home and we and were kind of sulking and the money ran out, right? And so literally nobody's making any paycheck. There's no more money for buying anything, for putting the robot on the road, not even for paying rent at our maker space. So we're like, crap, what are we gonna do? And it just so happened that at that time, we were getting drunk and watching sports, <laughs> watching TV, flipping through, and it just so happened that at that time, the World Cup was on, and it turns out that Team USA, the women's soccer team, made it to the finals, and they were gonna fight or go up against Team Japan. And so then it was like, wait, doesn't Japan, didn't like some artist create a robot in Japan at some point that looks kind of like ours? And indeed, there was a Japanese robot called the Kiratas robot. And it was created by this guy, Kiratasan, who is an artist, literally an artist. And so he worked with this uh, guy right here. As a, he's a robot uh, engineer. And uh, this robot looks really advanced, but it's actually not really that advanced. Um, but it looks great <laughs> because, uh, and you can put different paint jobs on it. And so we said, OK, well, if Hollywood's not gonna give us the money, then we have to make Hollywood come to us. And so, how do we do that? It was because it was July 4th, national pride is on the line, people are watching the World Cup. Um, and so, of course, I'm like, dudes, you know, like, uh, you know what we have to do. And it's, <laughs> we have to become Team USA, right? And so now I wanted to, uh, to show you what we came up with. Um, and this is sort of what put us on the map, uh, was this video. So we ended up making, shooting this video for $200 over the course of a weekend. We rented the camera from Autodesk. Um, they said, you're not allowed to rent it. We said, okay, and we stole it anyways. <laughs> we are no longer allowed to rent anything from there, but they liked us in the end because we produced a lot of value for them. So this is the video. And then sound would be cool. Yeah, turn it up if you can. This is where the Megabot Mark II was born. Born to inspire American innovation and determination. We just finished tightening the last bolts on the Mark II, America's first fully functional giant piloted robot. And because we're American, we've added really big. Sudobashi Heavy Industries beat us to the punch with the Kurados, a 9,000 pound single seater giant fighting robot with twin Gatling guns, a hyper advanced targeting system, and a full heads up display. Sudobashi, we have a giant robot, you have a giant robot. You know what needs to happen. We challenge you to a duel. Both of our robots will need modifications to become combat ready. Prepare yourselves and name the battlefield. In one year, we fight. So 
that video uh, then prompted a response from Sudobashi, and the, uh, again, some of the magic of this is that, yes, we had kind of spoken with Sudobashi, we had translated an, e an email into Japanese, we had sent it, hoping that they would be down with what we were getting ready to do. Luckily, they were, and so they were ready to release their version of a video response. Um, we sort of let them know that we were gonna release this. I don't know if they knew quite how American we would go with it. <laughs> But uh, so they came back and it, and it ended up being uh, a really fantastic uh, response video. And then I just want to show you uh, what we ended up doing with all of the coverage. Uh, we had the idea, I would say, maybe three days after the, we should challenge Japan to a fight. Uh, and then it was like, we should kickstart it. <laughs> like, let's make money from people. People probably were going to want to see this. Um, and so uh, that's what we did, and uh, this video is like a really good summation of sort of who we are as a company, and, uh, and it's coming towards the end of the time, so it might be the last thing, but we'll see. You grew up hoping that the giant robot battles in science fiction would become real, and we did too. Also self-produced video. It's one year away. Meet the Mark II, America's first fully functional giant pilot. <laughs> it's literally what we're building. Your childhood dreams have arrived. Hear them knocking? Buy a t shirt and open the door. Now let's meet the patriots who've signed up to be on Team USA. My name is Grant Mahara, and for the better part of a decade, I was a Mythbuster. I'm Trey Rossi. And I'm Greg Munson. And we are the creators of BattleBots. My name is Michael Howe, and I'm president of Howe and Howe Technologies. Hi, I'm Gary from Team IHMC Robotics. And I'm Doug. Hi, I'm Dave Laverick. Hi, my name is Juan Davis, winner of Wonko. Hi, I'm Carl Bass. I'm CEO of Autodesk. These old treads got no suspension and top out at 2.5 miles per hour. Howe and Howe Technologies has something to say about that. We developed the world's most advanced pack vehicle. We are excited to be a part of the Megabot Challenge. The Mark II is pretty top heavy. Right now, these legs are controlled by a couple of levers. We need to be able to keep our balance as much as the FRIHMC comes in. We have decades of experience with dynamic balancing robots. When we're done with the Mark II, it's going to float like a butterfly and stay like a charging rhinoceros. We're going to need more than this racing harness to keep us alive. NASA has experience with that. I've worked on every robotic system ever and drive on the surface of Mars. We're looking at how we might use NASA technology to help keep these guys safe and take advantage. This is America's first giant combat robot. She needs a fresh set of armor plates and a sweet paint job so we can make our country proud. The master of Fonco has our back. I've been working in the motion picture industry for over 25 years on series like Star Wars, Matrix, Terminator. And now, we're going to make the Megabot look like something straight out of Hollywood blockbuster. We're going to need the right tools to build this robot. Autodesk has it covered. We've been working with the Megabots guys since the beginning. We're going to make sure they have all the hardware and software they need to take on Japan. Finally, we have some killer advisors who are helping make this dream an epic reality. Seeing giant fighting robots has always been a personal dream of mine, which is why I'm going to do everything possible to help make this happen. By supporting this competition, not only will we be helping America win this challenge, but we're going to be moving the entire field of robotics forward. America, this is your robot. It's time to kick in and help support this cause. Support Team USA. Buy your Megabots gear, come see the robot in person, or even suit up to pilot this beast. After this video is over, you have a choice. Watch another cat video on YouTube, or make your childhood dreams come true. What's up? So, that is how you bootstrap a company. 
into existence that is literally now living the dream. And so we raised like $500,000 on Kickstarter selling t-shirts for advanced military grade robotics R&D, <laughs> which is pretty sweet. And what's even crazier is that we have about six minutes worth of YouTube content. Uh, so the challenge video, when we said, uh, let's challenge Japan, that actually went viral. It's number one on Facebook around the world, number one on uh, Reddit. Uh, and basically 12 million views uh, generated out of the six uh, minutes and 31 seconds of content, which, you know, it's not like a cat video. It's not 100 million views yet, but <laughs> it's still pretty good. But the most important thing is what we call earned media potential. And so uh, this number is now outdated. It's actually almost doubled now to 6,000 unique news articles written in every single major language on Earth. Uh, so we use PR tracking software to track audience. And so one billion people on the planet have heard about the, the robot duel with Team USA versus Team Japan. Um, one billion people out of seven billion people, and we don't have a TV show yet, we don't have a video game yet, um, and so all of this is bootstrapped. We were able to generate about a million dollars in revenue, so once people knew about us, then conferences started calling us, and Comic-Con and companies wanting us to come uh, do events with them uh, and demo the robot, and so sort of things got kicked off from there. Uh, and what's cool about that is that we ended up being able to attract some of the world's most amazing uh, partners, like some of these you've already seen. WME is the Hollywood's biggest agency uh, and also live event producer. Uh, IMG is with them. Um, so you've seen the BattleBots guys. The NASA one is one I'm super excited about. So they're partnered with us for STEM education outreach. And so basically inspiring kids to get into learning how to become engineers and uh, eventually become robot pilots. Um, uh, Helac Corporation, uh, you know, giving us hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of, you know, free hydraulic uh, parts, actuators. Um, you've got uh, How and How Technologies, uh, like you saw, this is the world's fastest tank. And so that is the tread system that we're putting on our robot currently. Um, and the treads are almost finished, actually. And uh, we're, our whole team is really excited about that. Um, uh, so uh, Mark Satrakian is the guy who is also a robot genius, uh, who put a lot of, who's put in a lot of robots uh, on television, basically. So that's Robot Fight, uh, Combat League, which was on the Sci-Fi Channel. Um, it was a semi-successful TV show. Uh, Grant Imahara from Mythbusters. Uh, Carl Bass, CEO of Autodesk. And hopefully, some sponsors or groups in Germany, in Austria, Maybe TNG, maybe you know BMW. I don't know Mercedes um, would be able to put together a, a franchise team uh, and become a partner uh, in the world's first ever giant fighting robot combat league. And what's great about what we're doing is that we're lowering the barrier to entry. And this is something what we learned from Boston Dynamics and also First Robotics and also the DARPA Robotics Challenge. So what we're doing is that we're actually building a kit of parts, which is the entire cohesive system that is required in order to build one of these uh, upgraded robots. And that includes uh, the control system, the, uh, the power, you know, the hydraulic uh, actuators, basically everything of the, uh, of the robot except for the skin and the skeleton. You still are gonna have to have really smart engineers, both mechanical and electrical, to put the system together and make it work and operate. You're gonna need probably at least three fabricators who can weld, sling steel around, make it look cool. You probably want a concept designer or an artist on the team to make it look cool. Uh, you probably want a project manager who can sell sponsorships to Red Bull or whoever. Uh, and then you need a makerspace or some facility with a giant crane um, and if you have all of those ingredients, then we should really talk because uh, we've already got uh, multiple countries signed up. Uh, we've got uh, you know, TV deals in the works. Uh, we have an entire rollout plan that you're gonna start seeing come alive uh, over the course of the next uh, six months or so. And so it should be really exciting. Um, so yeah, that's all I have. It's been one hour. So thank you very much for having me in Germany and thanks for listening. Does anybody have any questions?
So thanks a lot for the great talk. Do we have any questions? I bet we have. Ah, no, but you can buy them on our website, megabots.com slash store. We do ship internationally. <laughs> Another question. Everybody overwhelmed with these great uh, movies? So who wants, uh, there's one. Uh, so after the fight, how much actual damage do you expect? Mm. That's a great question. So the idea is that we're building the core of the robots, so like the center part, to be uh, uh, basically indestructible, like construction equipment. Um, however, the arms and the weapon systems are, are designed sort of like Mr. Potato Head, um, and that's a unique aspect of our system, uh, so that you'd be able to, if, if one part of the hydraulic system fails, usually the way hydraulic systems works is that if one part fails on the system, the whole system doesn't work. What we're doing is we're making it so that if one arm doesn't work, the rest of the robot still works. So we expect that the arms are going to be destroyed in most matches. Um, and you know the way that you drive these things is with GoPro cameras strapped all over the robot. And then the pilots sit in the back with screens or else VR helmet eventually. Um, and so that's the reason for the paintball is that if you can take out enough cameras on the opposing team, then they can't see out. Um, and they have to, uh, you know, tap out or, or give in to the other um, to the other team. Um, but uh, the equivalent of, of the destruction question is Formula One. So I don't know if any of you have seen the Formula One steering wheels, really advanced. So they're seventy-five thousand dollars per steering wheel. They have multiple steering wheels per race per car, and they use a brand new steering wheel every single race, no matter what. And so we're able to do 50,000, know, 25 or $30,000 per arm, which is the equivalent of a new Formula One steering wheel each match. Um, what are the rules, or are there any rules when fighting in an arena? So how big can the robot be? How big can your paintballs actually be? Are there rules? Yes. I hope not. The, uh, so, uh, the rules are uh, pretty simple. It's like gladiatorial combat. <laughs> um, so the rules are, you know, if the robot falls over and can't get back up, then obviously they lose. If the robot stops working, then they lose. And then there's emergency e-stop buttons for both teams and also from outside the robots. So whoever hits that, it's basically like tapping out in UFC or wrestling or something. Um, and, uh, and then we have a, a rule book similar to Formula One in, with a lot of engineering specs about you know, regulating power, for instance. And so that's one of the few things that we are actively regulating for the league is you know, how much uh, power are you able to have. So we expect some teams are going to you know, maybe have a giant robot uh, that's incredibly heavy and maybe indestructible. But there's going to have the same amount of power as the really light robot that's able to move more, you know, agile and sort of maneuver around and maybe more strategic. So it depends on the, on the teams, but we do have like a 20-page league primer document, which, uh, which uh, Henrik has actually seen. <laughs> and, uh, and I still hope that Henrik becomes the pilot in Team Germany, or one of the pilots. <laughs> OK, any more questions? Then I have one. When will you get your? Oh, sorry. So sorry if this might be a typical German question, but are you at all concerned of risk of bodily harm to the pilot or viewers? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> um, I mean, it's yeah. Obviously, everybody asks. Um, Ask that question. So our, our standard response, and, and you know, investors ask a lot of this. TV networks ask this. Um, we often joke that the first stadium or battle arena, it's going to be called maybe like uh, it actually it could be an alliance uh, stadium where an insurance company should actually build the stadium. <laughs> so in the U.S., that would be like Aflac Stadium, you know. Um, but uh, the same way that Formula One and NASCAR, I mean, you you have 200 cars going 200 miles an hour. They hit the wall, and somehow they're able to survive. And so if you compare that amount of force uh, with what we're doing, uh, we're doing like five mile per hour punches uh, in essentially construction vehicles, tanks. 
And so it's actually a lot less force than most motorsports. And so um, we do expect that you know, to be uh, a lot safer in, in that regard. And then also we have a, a, a lot of standards that we're building to for the cockpit, for instance. So fireproof, uh, waterproof, We've combined sort of engineering standards from all of these different places. For instance, elevators, uh, construction vehicles, Formula One, NASCAR, and we've sort of mishmashed them together to create safety standards. Uh, and then we're working with uh, you know great partners. So for instance, NASA is one of the partners. So we'll obviously have like vital signs coming off the the pilots, which I think is going to be great again for entertainment because then you'll see the heartbeat. You'll see eventually maybe brainwave monitoring, which uh, is going to be fascinating because what we're going to be learning is what makes a great giant robot pilot. And some people are going to be naturally inclined to it, um, and some people are not, are not going to be as naturally inclined to it. Um, we don't know who those people are yet, uh, but once we find them, they'll probably be the same ones that are going into outer space to mine asteroids and colonize Mars and stuff. So. <laughs> So what do you think? Uh, will Japan be a tough opponent? Are they collecting money, or do you have any news from so, them? So, yeah, this is uh, so secret, you know, so I don't know if there's, don't, don't publicize it or whatever, but uh, basically both teams are building completely new robots from scratch. So obviously our robot, our current robot has 24 horsepower. Our upgraded robot is 350 horsepower. Our current robot has no control algorithms or balance algorithms on it. The upgraded robot has 15 years of DARPA grade balancing control algorithms running on it. So you can imagine it's like a giant segue. So like as it you know drives, it'll sort of maneuver like naturally just by guide, you know, driving it with joysticks. Um, and it's got a, a eight foot long chainsaw powered by a, ha a Harley engine as one of the arms. You've got dual Gatling guns that pop out that shoot paintballs uh, inside eagle heads. And, uh, and we hope to also have the sound weapon. So when the, the guns come up, you'll hear the screech of the eagles. <laughs> and uh, hopefully that'll sort of catch them off guard. Uh, so Japan is also building a, a brand new robot and uh, maybe sort of traditional uh, to cultures you know, whereas Americans were like, hell yeah, like this is what we're doing, like <laughs> try to beat it, you know. Uh, Japan is very secretive, and so we don't really know what they're going to be coming up with. We know that it's going to be upgraded in all ways, and we've agreed to, you know, some basic standards and set of rules for the, for the uh, fight, uh, but we don't really know what they're going to do, but we do know that we'll win. <laughs> <laughs> How do you train for that? So do you train with the robot? Giant uh, uh, sand sacks for punching movements? Uh, or so this is a great question. Partners? So, so uh, follow our, uh, our YouTube channel. And over the course of like the next uh, seven months, we're going to start doing tests. And for instance, uh, one of the things that we promised on our Kickstarter is we're going to have a giant crane. We're going to be hanging a Toyota Prius from the crane <laughs> as, the, as the punching bag. <laughs> <laughs> hate to hate to say Toyota in there, but <laughs> they might be a sponsor one day. But until they are, <laughs> they're the boxing, the punching bag. Um, we're also going to have like a wrecking ball, which is going to uh, help sort of do stress testing. And then we have uh, what we call the robot combine. So like in the NFL or some other like sort of sporting events, they have like these tests b uh, before the actual match. Formula One, they have like the pre-race, the qualifying race to see where people place. Um, so we'll have an event similar like uh, to that, almost like an obstacle course slash tractor pull, accuracy tests. Um, so uh, we'll be filming a lot of that. And uh, we're, we just hired the, uh, a bunch of uh, production staff uh, that now work for us. And we're going to start making our basically our online uh, web series. And so you, you'll be able to watch it on, on YouTube to see how the, how the testing goes. OK, any more questions? Some of you have to want beer right now, right? <laughs> um, I wanted to know how much ammo can you load uh, into the robot? How, how much ammo? Yeah. 
Uh, that's a good question. We actually don't know the answer to that yet. That's going to be one of the things that we start testing. Uh, but we have uh, the idea, the goal, is to have uh, the ability to have lots of salvos on robot. Um, but we don't know the exact number of rounds quite yet. Okay, I'd say one last question, and then we go for the beer. Anybody? Okay, then thanks again for this fascinating talk. Cool. And Thank we're you. looking forward to the fight. Yeah.